What's up everybody, I'm Stan and welcome to Detail Comics where we go over comics in detail. This is Comics Cafe, the show where I go over my morning coffee and uh, talk about a topic with you guys and it's really more of the unedited, you know, really just straight communication with the, the fans and the people that watch the channel. And to be honest with you, I want to talk about one thing today and that is variants. So this is probably a pretty contentious topic amongst people in the comic book collecting industry simply because there are certain collectors that are just like, oh, variants are, you know, they're, they're a badass way to get alternative forms of art and there's this built-in sense of rarity. And I can remember back in when I was uh, collecting baseball cards, it's like you'd get insert cards, right? So you'd get like, you know, this one series, like the All-Star Rookies series, or you'd get the Pro Vision series, or you'd get like the Gold Leaf Signature series. And instead of being one out of every pack, it'd be one out of every 20 packs, one out of every 50 packs. And that would immediately make things more valuable, or at least perceived to be more valuable, because they're rare. And that's what happens in the comic book industry. So what I mean by a variant cover, and I'm going to show you a couple examples over here, is that you have your standard cover. So this is the cover that comes on every, well, it should come on every single issue of a comic book. However, what they do is they introduce variants. And variants can be produced in a one-to-one -one ratio, you know, for every main cover. There there is an alternative cover, so you know you could just as easily order that variant cover instead of the main cover. That's really up to you or your distributor to do so. And then they've got ones that are kind of called incentive variants. So these are only available for retailers that order a certain amount of comic books. So if you order 10 copies of Black Panther, you get the option to purchase one of these. If you order 25 copies of Reborn, you get to order, you know, one of the Todd McFarlane variants. If you order 100 copies, you get one of the sketch copies, and that brings the... It really doesn't add to the rarity. It puts the onus, you know, it puts the responsibility on the actual retailer to order enough copies of a comic book to get the special variant. And that means that these guys have to carry so much overhead. You know, if you wanted that 1 in 100 copy, that means that if you get it from your shop, they have to order 100 copies of a comic book. And they have to sell that in order to sell that one copy. So what do they do? They mark up these variants. And that gives them an implied value inside the market. What changes on the inside of the book? Nothing. What changes on the outside of the book? One page. So this is just a really... I don't know why I don't want to say shitty way to do things, but it's a very unique situation for the comic book uh, community in general in that they are putting the responsibility on the actual retailer to create a market and a demand for these particular copies. And I'm just going to give you a couple examples because you know, Black Panther number one, that was an extremely popular book when it was released, and there was a ton of different variants. I mean, you had the design character variant from Brian Stelfreeze, you had the uh, Disney Infinity variant for the Black Panther cover, you've got the Scotty Young cover, uh, you've got a Ryan Sook variant, you've got a 25th anniversary or 50th anniversary of Black Panther variant that comes along there, you've got an Oliver Koipel uh, Olivier Coipel variant cover that went along with that. You've got the Alex Ross 1 in 75 variant. So there's a lot of different variant covers that were available for Black Panther. And what did that result in? Black Panther sold 300,000 copies. It sold over 300,000 copies for its first issue. And then it went to a second printing too because everybody was super amped on what Ta-Nehisi Coates was going to be able to do with that book. And to give you an example, this is the Olive on the Olivier Coipel uh, variant cover for this. This is a 1 in 50. So if you've got 300,000 copies of this book in circulation, this is one of every, you know, out of every 50 of those copies, one of them is this. And that means that there's about 6,000 issues of this in, you know, the United States alone. So out of the 300,000, there's only 6,000 of these. So that makes this really, really rare, right? Well, you've got to kind of wonder about that. Because, you know, these are available, they're online, you know, comicspriceguide.com has them at like a $30 value. You might be able to pick one up for 20 you might be able to pick one up for 40 You know, that one's a 9.8, it's about as close to mint as I could possibly get. And I'm really just holding on to it, not to sell, but to collect, you know, just to have this moment in time for Black Panther. Because there's another book that's a little bit more rare, and you wouldn't necessarily expect it. That is Hyperion number 1. And you're like, why the hell is Hyperion number one more rare than this 1 in 50 variant? This is only like a 1 in 20, 1 in 25. The thing is, the circulation for Hyperion number one was about 40, 45,000 copies. And if that's a 1 in 20, 1 in you know, 25, that means there's 1,500 or 2,000 copies of that. So that is a more rare book. 
And what is the difference between Hyperion number one and the cover that I've got? None. It's got no difference on the inside. It is zero. But that configuration with that particular cover and that particular comic book is one of the lower production runs that they produce the entire year of any comic books. And that's why I see these ungraded copies potentially, try, uh, potentially trying to be resold on places like eBay for $60, $70, $80. This is probably one of the rarest Black Panther variants that you could possibly get your hands on over the course of the year. And that's including the Alex Ross variant because even if you've got 300,000 copies and it's 175, you're talking about 3,000, 4,000 copies, which is still more than what this Hyperion number one is. And that's where things get so screwy. It's just, it's ridiculous because what kind of collectability does Hyperion number one have? It doesn't really have any. Hyperion is a great character, but the series that it was in squandered his potential. So he was canceled after six issues. But then you have something like Black Panther, which sold 300,000 copies, continues to sell, you know, 40, 50, 60,000 copies every month. There's a major motion picture that's going to be coming out over the next two years that's in this character. Like, that character has so much potential for, for growth and things like that. But then we start looking at what I'm, I've been talking about for the last, you know, four or five minutes. And that's the collectability, that's the resale, that's the rarity. That's not what's important about these two comic books. The important thing is the story that's within the pages. That's what keeps people coming back. So the real question is, are variants a good thing for the comic book industry? Because if anybody has been around comic books for the last 30 years, they remember that there was a lot of hubbub and a lot of stuff regarding like variant covers, collectible covers. You know, Spider-Man number one was a huge deal. It had you know regular covers. It had a chromium cover. It had you know a gold cover. It had a silver cover. It had a platinum cover. And then you had the same thing with X-Men. X-Men number one had like five different connecting variant covers, and it was absolutely ridiculous. And if you remember what happened, the entire comic book industry crashed. You know, there was just a huge glut of people that were collecting and investing in comic books for the wrong reasons. There's a certain reason why Amazing Spider-Man 194 is worth money, or 129 is worth money. That's the first appearance of the Black Cat. It's the first appearance of the Punisher. Amazing Spider-Man 121, 122, you know, that whole storyline with the death of Gwen Stacy and finally the death of the Green Goblin. You know, these have purpose. They have a structure within the story that are key points. And they're not variant covers. Variant covers are a very odd thing, and I don't necessarily know what to think about them because I always appreciate the opportunity to get good art on a comic book. However, paying a premium and collecting them just for the sake of collecting the individual variants isn't necessarily something I'm all about because I don't necessarily see the enhanced value in having something that's a little bit more rare. Do I have these? Absolutely. You know, I got the I got a great deal on the the Black Panther variant and I picked the uh, Hyperion number 1 up at my local comic book shop. Uh, you know, that was like $3 over cover price and to see it be like $7 versus $80 is absolutely ridiculous because I was just like, ooh, that's a Black Panther cover. I should probably get that because I like the look of the cover, I like the look of the story, but it wasn't anything, anything where I was going to be like, okay, you know, I'll pick that up because it's $180 or, or you know, it's going to be worth $200 in the future. So I'm curious as to what you guys are thinking about variant covers and how they impact the industry because myself, I'm pretty torn, but I'm kind of leaning more in the direction that I don't necessarily appreciate all the individual variants that are coming out. Say DC Rebirth is doing it right. DC Rebirth has a situation where you can pick and choose which cover you want. Do you want the variant cover by an alternative artist, or do you want the regular cover that goes along with things? There are certain circumstances where I'll pick the variant cover because it gets rid of all that branding and marketing stuff for like, go see the new Suicide Squad video or, or stuff like that because it's just like, I don't want that on the cover of my comic book. It's hard enough to have the DC Rebirth banner across everything, which I think ruins the art itself. But it's one of those situations where it's just like, okay, cool, you know, J. Scott Campbell's doing a cover for Renew Your Vows. So I'll look into that, but if it's going to be $10, $15 over the regular price of a comic book, Ryan Stegman's doing a great job on the covers, he's doing a great job on the interiors, he's got a great story going along with Jerry Conway, why do I need to pay more just to have J. Scott Campbell's interpretation of the Spider-Man family on the cover of my comic book? 
So that's the question I'm going to pose to you guys. What do you think about variant covers and how they impact the industry? And this is probably something that we're going to dig in a little bit deeper on a little bit later on in a different kind of show. So those are my thoughts on variant covers, but I want to know what you guys think too. So hit me up in the comments down below and we can start that conversation. I also want to know what you guys think about potential video content, anything that you're looking to see. Do you want to see more reviews? Do you want to see me go over stories? Do you want to see more origin stories or history of different artifacts or things like that? I'm more than happy to see what I can provide for different options for everybody in the comic book community. So as always, if you like what you see, hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe right there to get more news, reviews, and commentary on comic books, comic book movies, comic book TV shows and games, and anything and everything inside the world of comics.